At the drop of a hat, an ordinary day can morph into the extraordinary, and the mundane can give way to the macabre. In mere seconds, life can unravel, plunging us into the depths of nightmares. Welcome back, folks. I'm Ryan from Tragedy Tales, and this week, yet again, I've tapped into the darkest recesses of the internet to bring you five more truly terrifying clips that were captured right before horror. From a helicopter ride to a wedding that went tragically wrong, to the man who believed he was Jesus, who went on a terrifying rampage. This week, we've got stories from all across the world. So, you know the rules. Sit down, grab a drink, and draw the curtains. Let's get right into it. In life, no matter how experienced you are, regardless of how many safeguards in place, regardless of how many eventualities that you plan for, things can still go awry and things can go terribly wrong. But it's what you do after the fact that shows who you truly are. With that in mind, this shocking entry brings us to Naples, Florida, on the afternoon of Friday, March the 10th, 2024. That day, five people boarded a Bombardier Challenger 604 private jet for a routine flight from the Ohio State University Airport to Naples Municipal Airport in Florida. It was a mundane day for many, but for those aboard, it would soon become a date forever etched in tragedy. Departing from the Ohio State University Airport in Columbus, Ohio, the aircraft carried two passengers, one crew member, and two very experienced pilots. These two pilots were Edward Daniel Murphy and Ian Frederick Hoffman. Murphy, aged 50, and Hoffman, aged 65, boasted extensive experience in the skies, totaling over 10,000 and 24,000 flight hours respectively. Their expertise instilled confidence in their passengers as they embarked on their journey back to the Naples airport. As scheduled, at 12.30 p.m., the engine started and they left the Ohio State University Airport. As the plane soared into the sky, the weather was beautiful and everything was going smoothly, as they always do in these videos. However, around three hours later, as the Challenger approached its destination in Florida, disaster struck with unforgiving swiftness. At approximately eight minutes past three, the Naples control tower cleared the Challenger to land on runway 23. but located approximately six miles from the airport while on the final approach to Naples Airport, within just seconds of one another, the pilots received four major warnings in the cockpit. They had one engine oil pressure warning for each engines, left and right, saying that they were somehow out of oil in both engines, and the fourth and final signal lit up in red, another engine oil warning. Just two minutes later, less than five miles from the runway, at 10 minutes past three, one of the pilots radioed in and said that they'd lost both engines. He said, emergency, making an emergency landing. Okay, uh, Challenger, uh, hop into 823. Lost both engines, emergency. I'm making an emergency landing. Emergency, clear to land, runway 23. Is that hop into 823? Uh, we're clear to land, but we're not gonna make the runway. Uh, we've lost both engines. The plane veered towards the ground, right towards the busy Interstate 75 highway. With zero engine power, the plane began tumbling from the sky, but luckily, both pilots were no strangers to emergencies. Within moments, they were suddenly thrust into a desperate battle against time and fate. Currently suspended 2,000 feet in the air, Murphy and Hoffman made a split-second decision that rather than make it to the airport, they would try and make an emergency landing on Interstate 75 sacrificing the comfort of a runway for the slim chance of survival. Traveling at 209 kilometers an hour, or around 130 miles an hour, the silent engines spelled impending doom as the Challenger hurtled towards the unforgiving asphalt below. At 10 past three, 
The passengers braced for impact as the jet made contact with the highway. The plane had plunged 2,000 feet all the way to the ground in less than a minute. A passing trucker was able to capture the descent and the terrible impact. Still traveling at a very fast speed, the jet touched the ground, completely blocking the southbound lane of Interstate 75. Amidst the chorus of screeching metal, the footage shows the jet barreling across the interstate, pulverizing a car before skidding over a grass shoulder area and slamming into a concrete barrier. The impact scattered pieces of the jet across the interstate like confetti. And seconds later, it exploded into a maelstrom of flames and destruction, sending a huge plume of black smoke billowing into the sky. This smoke cloud could be seen from miles away. One Naples area resident by the name of Ginny said that all of a sudden she saw black smoke and then she saw the flames. Miraculously, amidst the horror, some managed to escape the inferno. Despite the emergency exit being blocked by fire, passengers and crew scrambled to safety, guided by the cabin attendant who had led them through the open baggage compartment. Drivers who were traveling along in the opposite way that day recorded footage of the plane being ravaged by fire. First responders rushed to the scene to witness pure horror. The entire crash scene was drenched in jet fuel and heavily damaged by the erupting blaze. Sadly, trapped within the twisted wreckage of the cockpit, for pilots Murphy and Hoffman, there would be no salvation. Despite efforts to retrieve them from the fire, they were both unable to be rescued and perished amongst the flames. This crash reached mainstream and international news. But despite that, no one seems to have heard about it. I only heard about it because of a comment. I would have never found this just by searching through Google. By the end of the day, the fire had been extinguished in the plane, leaving the charred fuselage sitting by the side of the road, covered in ash. So I know what you are wondering, how could this possibly happen? How is it even possible to lose oil in two separate engines at the exact same time and then experience dual engine failure within seconds of each other? Something just doesn't seem right here. Aviation experts and industry veterans alike were baffled by the tragedy, unable to come up with a reason as to why both engines had lost power in such rapid succession. Aviation trial attorney Bob Clifford, who has handled private jet and commercial crashes since the late 1970s, said that what occurred here is extraordinarily rare. He said, how do you lose oil pressure in two engines in a row? You just don't lose oil pressure twice. In the aftermath of the crash, investigators from the National Transport Safety Board descended upon the scene, determined to unravel the mystery behind the catastrophic engine failures. Every fragment of the wreckage was meticulously examined every detail scrutinized in the pursuit of answers. But sadly, however, despite exhaustive efforts, the cause of the dual engine failure was unable to be determined. The Challenger, built in 2004, had been very well maintained and was even recently inspected, holding no obvious mechanical faults. The safety board's investigation extended beyond the physical wreckage, delving into the black box to analyze the cockpit recordings and the flight data hoping that this data will reveal further clues. However, none of this has been released to the public as of yet. But this was unbelievable, tragic, and just unlucky. However, if it weren't for the heroic actions of pilot Murphy and Hoffman, who knew exactly what to do in this emergency situation, this crash would have almost certainly claimed all of their lives. They are true heroes who gave their lives for their passengers and I salute them for this. But to have both engines fail at the exact same time, what are the chances? It just goes to show the inherent risks of flight and the fragility of just human existence. And it goes back to what I said in my intro, life can truly turn at the drop of a hat. Talking about life turning at the drop of a hat, 
this entry continues to be no exception. It begins on the eastern Black Sea coast in a city called Potty, a port city located on the western coast of Georgia, on Wednesday the 7th of February 2024. That brisk winter morning at approximately 8.30 a.m., three men gathered at a football stadium in Potty and boarded a Cameron Z315 gas-powered hot air balloon. That day, the three men had planned to do something that no one had done before. They intended to break a distance-traveled world record. This flight was meant to be the first ever hot air balloon flight across Georgia, flying all the way from Potty to the Vashlavani National Park, a distance of around 400 kilometers, or around 250 miles. The three men who intended to break this record were Misho Bidzina Vigili, 52-year-old Polish pilot Krzysztof Zapart, and 70-year-old Georgian pilot Rivas Utoguari. Now, Misho was the only non-pilot in the basket that day, as he worked at Amedi TV as a videographer. 52-year-old Krzysztof was the founder of Balloon Club Swindica and loved hot air balloons. And last but not least, Rivas Utoguari was a veteran and three-time national record holder in ballooning. He was actually the president at the National Aeronautics Federation of Georgia and was even the founder of the Sky Travel Group. In the days leading up to that morning, Rivas had posted on his social media several times, showing him building the basket and applying modifications to ensure a smooth flight. In one post, he said, the distance is not very long, but the flight is difficult as it passes mainly over the mountains. Even up to the night before, as excitement and anticipation bubbled over, Rivas posted to his Facebook, inviting all of his fans and friends to watch the balloon ride live. So, after weeks of preparation, that morning, the three of them suited up and prepared for a lengthy trip. Rivas posted once again to his Facebook, telling folks again where they could watch the journey, with photos of the basket ready for flight. As the trio left from a stadium in Potty, this photo was captured. Just like that, they set off. Instantly, they were gliding through the air with grace and precision. After getting some elevation, soon after setting off, Rivas posted another photo to his Facebook. In this final photo, Revas can be seen smiling with Kristoff, with clear blue skies and mountains in the distance. This photo was captioned, we took off at 8.30, getting altitude, getting on course. So, everything looks like it was going as expected. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the balloon made it about two thirds of the way before tragedy struck with brutal force as the three men and the balloon came over the small German village of Assoreti, nestled in the southern Georgian countryside. Wind speeds picked up significantly. While they tried to fight it, the men blew drastically off course and it was obvious that this attempt was a failure. So they tried to land. The balloon could be seen by onlookers getting blown all around the place, being blown wildly out of control, swaying drastically in the wind. This is when this footage was recorded. You can see the balloon coming into land. It gets closer and closer to the ground and it looks like it's gonna land no problem. But this is when a huge gust of wind swept in, ripping the balloon back off the ground and up into the air. This gust of wind just didn't stop. As it blew, it dragged them up a hill and they got dangerously close towards a set of high voltage power lines. Within seconds, the balloon struck the electrified lines and as the wind kept howling, it got caught on the lines and blew in the gust. It then caught on fire, shredding into pieces, soon setting the basket on fire. By the end, there was almost nothing left of the balloon. Now, I can only imagine the horror, knowing that you're being dragged, knowing that there's no way to actually escape but I don't think any of them thought that this was gonna be this bad. I doubt any of them saw this danger coming. Ambulances rushed to the scene, but horribly, all three men had perished. As a memorial, 
Medi TV changed its program to honor Michaud, who had perished in the crash. Revas's daughter, Iron, expressed her love on Facebook, saying that he left with a smile, doing his very beautiful and beloved job, leaving me on the ground. This tragedy was Georgia's first hot air balloon accident in almost two decades. As far as I can tell, there doesn't seem to have been any bad weather forecast on this day, or surely the trip would have been called off. It's just honestly bad luck all around, and to watch it unfold on camera, it's totally shocking. Soon after the crash, the Ministry of Internal Affairs launched a probe into the accident, saying that under Article 275 of the Criminal Code, that there had been a violation of flying rules. However, it's not yet been revealed what these violations were. Your wedding day is supposed to be the happiest day of your life. One that you remember for years to come. But you never expect this to happen. This truly shocking footage was captured on the 4th of December 2016 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. That Sunday was a very special day. It was actually the wedding for 32-year-old Rosemir Nascimento Silva and 34-year-old Adderley Damasino. With 300 guests due to arrive, the day had been planned meticulously, but Rosemere was planning something that her husband-to-be was completely unaware of, something that would leave her guests in awe. You see, Rosemere had a childhood dream of swooping into her wedding venue in a helicopter, all without people knowing, surprising the guests, ensuring the day was as epic as it could be. This was a dream that Rosemere had organized to fulfill. At the reception, located on the outskirts of Sao Paulo, at around 4 p.m., Rosemere's fiance, Adderley, was standing at the altar with 300 guests eagerly awaiting the bride's epic arrival. This arrival was one that only a handful of guests at the venue were aware was even happening. Other guests were just told that something epic was happening. As they waited for her at the venue, Rosemere, her brother Silvano, the pilot, Peterson Pinheiro, and the wedding photographer, Naila Christina Neves, who was actually six months pregnant, hopped into a Robinson 44 helicopter in Uzascu for a scenic flight over the hills and towards the wedding venue. The journey to the outskirts of Sao Paulo was a trip that should have taken around 15 minutes. Sat on the helipad with everything ready to go, this is where the clip begins. The footage shows the bride-to-be and her brother in the back of the helicopter, with the photographer and the pilot in shotgun. It's all sunshines and smiles at takeoff. The weather looks just perfect for flying, it looks beautiful. As the helicopter chops through the air, everyone was smiling, taking in the views, until the camera pans forward and you can see a huge, ominous wall of fog. Checking the historical weather for that day, I can't see any fog forecast. It was a sunny day with overcast skies predicted, but nothing like this. All on video, the pilot doesn't even consider turning around. He continues plowing forward, straight into the fog. As they enter the wall of fog, anxiety builds in the passengers as the mist enveloped the helicopter. Soon, nobody could see in any direction. They were right in the middle of a cloud. This footage is almost impossible to watch. It makes me so anxious that they can't see a meter in front of them, but the pilot's still continuing. I'm not a pilot, so I have no idea what you should do in this situation, but I don't know, if it was me, I'd just go up in the air and see if I can see anything at all. In this case, the pilot carefully navigated through the thick fog when all of a sudden, an alarm goes off and everyone panics.
Within an instant, the helicopter spiraled out of control and horror ensued. The camera shows frames of pure carnage before colliding into the ground with a huge crash. And then, silence. The recording continues showing the grass with a red flashing light illuminating the ground. A total of eight fire engines rushed to the scene of the crash, but tragically, all four occupants perished on impact, killing Rosemere, her brother, the pilot, and the pregnant photographer. Back at the wedding, the groom, the families, and the other 300 guests waited and waited, and Rosemere and the other missing guests were nowhere to be seen. At this point, the groom had no idea that his fiance had planned to arrive in a helicopter at all. This was all supposed to be a surprise. 60 minutes passed and the helicopter had not yet arrived at a nearby football field. One of the organizers of the wedding made a phone call and confirmed that it had taken off as expected. This is when pure panic began to build. At 6.30 p.m., with the groom Adderley still standing by the altar, only then did the pastor lean in and break the terrible news to him, causing him to collapse in shock. An investigation was opened into why all of this occurred and an accident report was released. This report revealed that the flight rules, as well as the guidelines contained in the flight manual, were not properly observed by the pilot. They concluded that the fog had obviously caused loss of visual references and complete loss of awareness of the position of the aircraft. The pilot had no reference as to his trajectory, which ultimately led to the loss of control and the crash. They also discovered that the helicopter involved did not even have a air taxi registration, technically making it an illegal flight. Despite their investigations, they were unable to determine what exactly caused it to spiral out of control. However, re-watching the haunting video, it's assumed that the pilot hit a tree or the side of the hill while he was descending. But this was just stupidly tragic. The fact that Rosemere was on the way to her wedding the fact that it was her childhood dream to do this, it just makes me sad that her dream got her killed. But my heart aches for a Durley that stood at the altar for hours waiting for news, only to be told that his beloved wife had passed away in a helicopter accident. I personally think the pilot should have turned around and cancelled the moment that he saw the fog, but instead he continued on thinking that his pilot skills could navigate him through no visual references and it cost him his life, the life of an unborn child and three innocent people. Of course, hindsight is 2020, but next time you think about arriving in style to anything, whether that be a skydive, a helicopter, or even a jet ski, perhaps think twice, maybe taking the car ain't so bad. This downright horrible entry actually begins on Good Friday, April the 19th, 2019, on Addison Street in Tibshelf, Derbyshire. However, this particular Good Friday would be anything but good. On that fateful day, on a quiet street in Tibshelf, 39-year-old Gavin Collins was about to do something that would ruin multiple lives, cause untold misery, and shock the world. Rolling the clocks back to literally the previous day, Gavin had been released from HNP Ranby after serving a four year prison sentence for burglary, theft, and other dishonesty offenses. Now Gavin had a troubled past, being in and out of prison all the time, his life marred by mental issues, all shadowed by a long standing battle with addiction to class A drugs. Being described as volatile, Gavin was a man haunted by hallucinations. He reported seeing dark shapes and said that his mind would conjure up images of ninjas out to get him, but he accepted ninjas where he lived would be very strange. Inside prison, Gavin would try anything to get into trouble, finding himself in segregation multiple times, setting fire to his cell twice, assaulting prison officers with weapons and fashion knives, and even beginning a riot. However, Despite his terrible behavior behind bars, 
literally making him the stereotype of a person who should be in prison. Gavin still found himself granted an early release under the home detention curfew scheme, a scheme that allows prisoners to return home to a residence under tag. This decision to release him would soon unleash chaos. On the morning of April the 19th, it began like any other, but it quickly spiraled into a nightmare. At around 8.45 in the morning, Gavin, propelled by delusion, suddenly barged into a neighbor's home, proclaiming himself as Jesus Christ before commandeering their car keys and speeding off into the day. This is when this footage was captured. It's unsure that Gavin even knew that he was being recorded, but all captured on dashcam footage, Gavin could be seen driving insane. I'm not even sure I can show half of this on here without catching an age restriction, so I'll do my best. But the footage shows Gavin as he raced from his home through the streets of Skegby, Nottinghamshire, his cries of divine identity echoing through the chaos. All on video, he can be heard screaming, let's go, let's go, and that he was Jesus, the descendant of God. Oh, you're helping me. Good, keep it going. Because it's good Friday. And you know what? You talk getting rid of all the coppers. Let's go, let's go. I'm enraged. I'm Jesus. I'm descendant of God. And you lock me up. Next, he can be seen whizzing down the street, shouting, watch me go, watch this. I'm getting stronger by the second. Watch this, you f***ing, you think I'm strong? Wait until you f***ing meet my s***. Stop him, because ultimately, he'll give her an ultimatum. Either listen to Gavin, mum, or I, you're gonna go to hell. Then he'll disown you, and so will I. But it's now grandma's! The rightful ones! How it's meant to be! Watch this! Watch me go! You Watch this now! I'm getting stronger and stronger by the second! This erratic driving culminated in a violent collision with a house on Mansfield Road in Nottingham, narrowly missing the startled homeowner who was outside in the process. Undeterred by the crash and the wreckage, Gavin, consumed by delusion, confronted the homeowner, now demanding their car keys with a chilling ultimatum. He said, do you believe in Jesus? Because I am Jesus and I will kill you if you don't give me the keys. This homeowner refused to give him anything. This refusal only fueled Gavin's descent into madness as he hijacked another vehicle who had stopped to help and fled towards Mansfield Woodhouse. The time was now 9.15 a.m. and the police had started getting loads of phone calls about a vehicle that was driving erratically up a road and all over the pedestrian paths. As the police rushed to catch up with him, the ensuing mayhem saw Gavin leave a trail of destruction in his wake. He went on to crash this second stolen car into a set of metal barriers before making his way on foot to a random nearby house in Worcester Avenue. This house had a mother and her two young children inside. Gavin made his way around the back of the house and picked up a huge concrete patio slab. He then used this to smash in the back doors and charge inside this house. In the process of doing this, he cut his hand pretty bad and was bleeding profusely. In a rage, he shouted to the homeowner and threatened her before smearing crucifixes on the windows using his own blood. Again, he then demanded the mother's car keys, to which she of course refused. Gavin then threatened to kill her children if the keys weren't given over 
so of course the keys were handed over. Before leaving, Gavin drew a crucifix on each one of their heads with his blood before leaving the house and hopping into his third stolen car of the day. Gavin put the car into reverse and reversed quite deliberately at some speed and over a considerable distance into bystander 87 year old Terry Radford who was just waiting at the bus stop by his home. Terry, who was a retired teacher and a former magistrate, a much loved member of his community and a beloved grandfather was brutally crushed against the bus shelter. Gavin jumped out of the car and began screaming, I've killed him, I've killed the devil. After this, Gavin went round multiple nearby houses, knocking on the doors and threatening to kill them, terrifying everyone. There was even reports that Gavin was wielding a machete. In a final act of defiance, Gavin then jumped back into this stolen vehicle before ramming a police car and driving away. An air ambulance arrived at a nearby field within minutes, but sadly, nothing could be done to save Terry's life. He was declared dead right there on the pavement. Soon after making off, the police were actually able to catch Gavin with tasers where he was quickly apprehended. But by now, the damage was done. In November of 2019, Gavin appeared at court, accused of burglary, aggravated taking of a vehicle, attempted robbery, one kidnapping, and one count of murder. He denied all these charges. He denied murder by reason of insanity. In the trial, the judge revealed that Gavin had since been diagnosed with schizophrenia and a psychoactive disorder. Because of this, his murder charge was dropped to manslaughter. On Wednesday, the 1st of July, 2020, a jury concluded that Gavin was unfit to stand trial for murder, finding him guilty, however, of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Gavin was jailed for manslaughter and handed a life sentence with a minimum term of 21 years. For the family affected, however, this did little to quell the horror. They were furious that Gavin had wormed away from consequences and they were even more angry at the fact that he'd been released at all, given his behavior and history of mental illness. An investigation was opened into why Gavin had been let loose and it was found that policy was not followed during his release process, finding issues with the governors of the prison and the scheme that allowed him an early release. Now five years on from this horror, Terry's family continue to fight for the justice that they so rightly deserve. They've raised this with their MP, and their MP publicly stated that the governors who let Gavin free should be sacked from their jobs at HMP Ranby and should never be able to serve in the prison service again. However, at the time of writing this, absolutely nothing has changed with the release scheme, nor have any of the governors of the prison been held accountable for letting this insane man back on the streets. This entry takes us all the way back to India where on this channel, I've delved into some profoundly tragic and just bizarre occurrences. From a man who died zip lining on his ponytail to another man who was toying with snakes and paid the ultimate price. These incidents were undoubtedly crazy and absurd ways to meet one's end. However, the events that I'll be discussing in this entry somehow surpassed them all in absurdity and avoidable loss of life by far. This footage was recorded on the evening of October the 19th, 2018, in the city of Amritsar, the second largest city in the Indian state of Punjab. That night, millions of Hindus across India 
and across the world, were busy celebrating Dashera, a major Hindu festival celebrated at the end of another festival each year. So they have two festivals back to back. To celebrate Dashera, amongst other things, the main tradition is to burn effigies of the ten-headed demon king Ravana. This supposedly symbolized the victory of good over evil, and these effigies are often huge in size and are packed to the brim with fireworks and other firecrackers. So when it's set alight, it crackles and pops in all different colors, creating lots of noise and often attracting huge crowds. As the day went on, the streets were filled with laughter and joy, and as the night settled, many effigies were lit all across Amritsar, with one in particular being lit on the eastern outskirts, attracting a crowd of around a thousand people. Before this was even lit, however, just due to where the venue was set up and where the effigy was, and the fact that there was a six foot wall around it, around 300 individuals of the crowd overflowed through a small gate and onto a nearby stretch of land that seemed to be elevated. From this vantage point, they could get a better view at the effigy and get better photos and videos. Shockingly, this stretch of land was in fact live train tracks. This was something that everyone must have been aware of because they would have been locals and not to mention you stood on train tracks and there would have been train line infrastructure around, but this didn't seem to bother anyone. It's worth noting that nobody should have been in this area, so technically they were all trespassing. On this stretch of land, around 300 spectators continued watching the firecrackers pop, recording it on their phones, smiling and having a great time, when, within a blink of an eye, the darkness was pierced by a blinding light. Many people looked up to see a commuter train coming in their direction. Because of the loud sound that the effigy and the crowd were producing, not everyone heard this coming train. Most were able to jump out of the way or hopscotch onto the other track to avoid being hit. As the crowd lurched onto the adjacent track to avoid the oncoming train, before the people could even catch their breath, before they could even process what just happened, a much, much faster second commuter train came flying in the opposite direction. With literally zero time to react, the train plowed into the crowd, wiping out everything in its path. This second train pulled many, many people under it as it swept by, leaving pure devastation in its wake. The train continued flying by as it honked its horn, but it didn't stop. Only when the dust settled did they realize how many people had just been run over. Only then did the horror of the night become clear. People turned to their phone, they put their torch on, to see a scene that I won't even describe here. The train had killed dozens instantly, injuring many, many more. Bodies and limbs lay strewn across the tracks and grassland, some describing it like a bomb had gone off. Emergency services whisked away those who were injured, but this in itself was a huge task as over 100 people had sustained an injury in some form. Some had their whole legs sliced off, while others had lost hands or whole arms. While the task of getting the injured to hospital was very difficult, the other task of identifying the dead would be a far more laboursome process, as many of the dead were dismembered or mutilated beyond recognition. On October the 20th, the day following the accident, locals organised a sit-in protest along that railway urging officials and the train driver for action, seeking compensation for the victims. Another burning question that many were wondering was why had the effigy been built so close to the tracks? Yes, the people shouldn't have been there, but why was the effigy facing towards the train tracks then? Horribly, on the evening of October the 19th, 
authorities announced that they had found 50 bodies. However, the following day, nine more bodies were recovered, bringing the official death toll for this entirely avoidable incident to 59. 59 people lost their lives, focusing on a shiny, colorful fire when they should have been paying attention to where they were standing. I know the safety around tracks in India is questionable to say the least, as I covered a story about a man who was weighing on train tracks in India, only to be killed by a flying cow that had been hit by a passing train. Train lines over there just seem to be something that has no respect at all. But to me, it's like this was the perfect recipe for disaster. The tracks, the effigy muting the noise of the oncoming trains, it's almost unbelievable. According to reports, the driver reported the incident when he arrived back at the station, so he didn't even stop. Upon questioning, he claimed that he'd received a green signal and was completely unaware of the hundreds of people on the tracks. He said that he'd applied the emergency brakes and that he did honk his horn, but by then it was just too late. In his defense, the Minister of State for Railways for India stated that the railway administration was not notified of the festival's location or timing. He deemed it a clear case of trespassing, and when questioned about why the train didn't halt or decelerate upon approaching, this official cited that dense smoke was obscuring visibility and added that the driver was navigating a curve, he came round the curve and then saw the crowd. Railways Minister of State refuted any negligence on the driver's part and declared that no action would be taken against him. At this time, the Indian Prime Minister announced a two lakh compensation to the families of the dead, equal to around 1,900 Great British Pounds, or around 2,400 US dollars, and they also awarded 50,000 rupees to the injured. So, next time you're in the dark and you're watching fireworks, and you think, I'm going to get a better view, just be careful where you're standing on. Make sure you're not standing on a train track, because this was bloody horrific. But that is the end of the video. May the 59 people that perished in this horrible train accident and the rest of the people featured in this video rest in peace. But holy hell, this one was crazy. I have no idea how I keep managing to find these wild clips that I've never seen before. Most of these cases didn't even reach international news. Most of them I only found out due to comments or very hard research. The Florida plane crash onto Interstate 75 was bizarre and just kind of unbelievable. Experiencing dual engine failure at the exact same time. Seriously, what are the chances? It goes to show that when your time is up, it's up. The pilots did an amazing job at saving the lives of their passengers. If it weren't for their quick actions, I'd say that everyone on that jet would have died that day. The men who dared to break a world record only to be swept up into power lines is shocking and just horribly crazy. The video shows that literally within seconds, the balloon swept up with the wind into the power lines. It does make me wonder why balloonists don't wear a parachute or something for emergencies just in case something goes wrong. This one, I've got to say, is just an act of God, I guess. Unless there's a forecast that I couldn't find that forecasts the bad wind, then it's poor planning. The chopper that crashed on the way to the wedding venue was terrifying. I would have been so scared in those final moments. With fog in all directions, they could have been 500 feet up or 50 feet up. There was no telling what was what, and it's no wonder that the pilot got disorientated. It's bloody tragic that nobody survived, and it's sad that the husband was stood at the altar waiting, not knowing that the love of his life had perished in a helicopter crash. Gavin, who went on a joyride and took the life of innocent Terry, truly abhorrent. I understand that he was going through a mental episode at the time. That doesn't make the footage and the things that he did any less shocking. However, if the prison system had done its job effectively and not let this dangerous criminal out on the street, Terry would almost certainly still be with us today. I personally hope that the governors get the sack for releasing him. But of course, nothing's happened as of yet, and I doubt anything will happen. And last but not least, the crowd in India being hit by two trains. What do I even say? This whole situation is crazy. Completely crazy. 
and tragically avoidable. The fact that 59 people lost their lives watching an effigy stood on train tracks is ridiculous and horrific. But most importantly, what did you think of this one? As always, I read every single comment below, even the nasty ones, and I know my upload schedule's been completely whack recently. So if you're this far in and you've not subscribed, why not go down there and tap that like and subscribe button and don't forget to click the notification bell to be immediately alerted when I release content such as this. But I will see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.